more in here because that's not very helpful. But I have some notes, and I will will edit the the wiki afterwards to to deal with nested loops. And when I say nested loops, I mean something like um, we have a for loop, and within that for loop, we have another for loop. We have like, you know, J. And within here, we're doing something to, you know, I don't know, <coughs> multi variable array. Some matrix. There we go. We're doing matrix stuff. Uh, or not matrix stuff. Or maybe we want to loop through two different strings and do some kind of comparison or something. Um, so, so embedded loops, this is what I mean by embedded loops. You have one loop within another. And there, there's a technique for dealing with this. And it is, uh, it is dealing with it in two different phases. Um, when, you see, when you see this in assembly, uh, when, when you see something that looks like a for loop in assembly, but it's a big nested thing. Um, for example, when we take a look at phase six, and it's this big nasty thing, this graph here, love really. Um, there's, there's a way to, to deal with that. To, to simplify it, or to, to break it down, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, so instead of showing you actually exactly what you need to do on that phase, I'm going to go back to phase five and take a look at this, because we have a for loop here. And if this was part of a larger, nastier thing, we can reduce this down by holding down control P and see how the mouse pointer changed. I now have a plus sign. I hold down the control key. I can click on these components, excuse me, to the for loop. Um, and actually, let me. Say P as in pop up. Hold. What was that? Hold down no. control. Oh, control P. Yeah, the control Got key, it. and you click on each of these boxes that is part of the for loop. I'm even going to do that one because that's the um, initialization. And see how now they're all gray? If I, I can let go of the control key. And now if I, if I right click on any of these, I'll do this one, I have this option to group nodes. Choose group nodes. I'm going to say that this is for loop one. And OK. And it collapses them down. You can do that and simplify your graph and then handle each one on its own. Um, and the best way to do that in terms of understanding is identify the inner loop and start collapsing from there and work your way out. And then when you start to actually do your analysis phase, you start with the outermost loop. You, you uncollapse that and to uncollapse, you, there's this uncollapse group icon right there that you just click on that. Um, and then you can collapse them back together to build the collapse group. Uh, another way of dealing with these that can help is something we went over in the beginning of the class, which is coloring. You can mark 
these with a certain uh, oops, with a certain color. There's the set node color icon here in the upper left of each node, and you can say, okay, I want to make that you know, cyan um, as a means of either saying I've looked at this one or this one seems to be part of this group. I could color all those the same, and just to kind of go through and uh, and and help organize for yourself. But in terms of the loop grouping and and then ungrouping, identify the innermost loop, group that, and then work your way up from there. And then when you try to um, do the actual analysis piece, start with the, the outermost loop, unroll that, figure out what's going on there, and then work your way down. Now you may ask, how do I identify what is the innermost loop? Um, it'll be a loop within a loop within a loop. Um, one technique, this isn't always the case, but one technique you could use is try to look for the return from the function and work your way back from that to identify what the innermost loop is and start there. Yes? Can you put a group of the boxes around? Like this could be helpful. Like rearranging them into groups instead of just color up. Um, you can't. So Sean asked the question, does moving the boxes around help? Um, it, it can. I mean, for that nasty looking graph, um, it certainly can. So feel free to move these boxes around just be aware that the the lines um, aren't looks like aren't going to move. I think maybe in the pro version they're better at that. But um, but certainly feel free to move around things a little bit. Um, one thing I will say before you start this phase, close Ida, let it pack the database and save. Um, and maybe even take it and copy, and then go back in, so that if you do um, make some changes and you want to undo that, you did some grouping that wasn't quite right. Basically, if you get messed up in here, there's no way to undo. The only way to undo is to say, okay, close and don't save the database. And then when you reopen it, it'll be back to where it was last previously saved. So just a heads up on that one. So that's one piece of, of this next one. Any questions on that? So there, there's not an undo in the pay version. Well, let me rephrase that. I heard a rumor that they either, the very latest version they came out with, they either have finally put in an undo or they're <coughs> thinking about it, but not in any of the versions of IDA I have used. And they try to try to be very, um, try to make the users cognizant of the fact that there is not a, an undo. I'll double check for the, uh, the latest features of the latest version though. So, I have a question slash observation. I'm looking at this and I've noticed that the loop counters for the inner and outer loop are each iterated like in two or three different places. What gives? Is that is that is that like a natural artifact of compilation or is that the uh, people who put this together screwing with us? There's not any um, intentional obfuscation in the right. bottom left. Okay. I'll put it that way. So, so there's there's another piece of this uh, next phase that you're going to want to know how to deal with. So let me just make sure that everybody's cool with the, the whole identifying loops and, and collapsing them. Uh, Corey has the latest and greatest, and there is no undo. So there we go. Okay. So, no questions. We will take a look at the next 
part of what you need to know. Um, oh, yes, and don't forget um, pseudocoding like, like we did with phase five, writing it out. This is what it is, kind of one loop at a time, that it can help to, to better understand what's going on. Um, one other thing that was pointed out during the break, I want to make sure I mention, is um, feel free to rename stuff, variables in particular. Um, it can you'd be surprised how much that can help with understanding what's going on. Seeing, you know, var underscore six, um, it's it maybe you can keep that in your head, you know, what that means, but just name it something else and, and it'll be much easier for you. Okay, so let's talk about structures. So what's what do we mean when we say structures? What's a structure? Linked list. Yes, that is an example of a structure, a linked list. How how appropriate are you seeing as the example here is talking about linked lists? Um, so in C, what we're talking about is when we have a, a struct. And it has members. A struct is um, just a way of saying this thing is actually a, a combination of a number of uh, several other variables, but in a very specific format, like, um, I don't know, name, age, height, you know, eye color, something like that. Um, and then each of these could be, um, maybe this is a car star, or maybe it's just a um, I don't know, car 32, 128, you know, age, that could be a, an int, or if you're really old or long. Um, height is maybe a, what, the high color, that could be a, Who knows? So that that could be a struct, and um, what's the C syntax? The name, the struct type comes up here, right? Struct person, and then to declare a variable of that type, you say person uh, Frank. And now I can refer to or set the uh, variables of Frank, like so, Frank.name. Um, I could do like a stir copy. Frank.name, Frank. Stuff like that. Or do Frank.age equals uh, 99. I don't know. What have you. But that, that would be how you would refer to parts of it. Anybody understand? Everybody understand? Basic idea of struct. Any questions on that? Usually rename basic block location name. Basic block location. Oh, um, so renaming basic block location names. Yes, actually, um, I personally will do that to help me understand. Uh, especially when you get into more complicated parts of the code to help me understand what's going on. Um, I will also use comments, which I will make note to go over this sooner. So you could add comments to lines in Ida. If, you, if you're on a line and you hit the semicolon key, you can say this is a comment. Oop. Okay, and it puts it afterwards. So the semicolon puts it afterwards. It just puts it off to the side. And then to add that comment, you just go to the line, semicolon, you can remove it. Um, so that's also something that that I will do to help me try to understand 
what's going on. If I think I figured out, you know, what you know, maybe like these three lines are doing, I'll put a comment um, here at the beginning that says, you know, next three lines, such and such. Um, but renaming, yeah, like so something like this, I could rename that to uh, or or rename this to for loop exit condition or something more helpful we may be exit if greater than equal six Okay, so back to structs. Struct, struct, struct. So that's the basic idea of a struct. Um, when we're talking about, so structs you can use for, for various things, for, for, um, for uh, well, linked lists is one example. Linked list, just to go over, is when you have a a structure it can be you know multiple things or it can even just have one thing in it but what it must have is a uh, pointer to uh, the next that's, that's the prototypical name for that variable though it doesn't have to be where it points to the the next one in the linked list um, and that's why it's called a linked list because you have a, 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 a uh, something that would be like like a person star head, and then you would have your head points to um, whatever the beginning of your your linked list is. You can have like um, a person um, bar person and Homer, and I'll, I'll actually show you a, an example of this. Um, where you can have, uh, okay, I have my head uh, can point to um, Homer. And then I can have my head next can point to, we'll do Maggie. And I can have my head next, next, point to Bart. Or another way of doing this would be, okay, now my head points to head next. And that's one way of traversing the link list. Head next points to part. And that's a way of filling out, okay, I now have a link list of Homer, points to Maggie, points to Bart. Let me show you visually what that means. So, Say so this is my memory space, zero up here, down there. Let's say I have a, let's do this, Homer. Next. Or, or actually, we'll do this. What that actually is going to be is name is a field, and next is a field, and we can have our head can point to there, and that would be the actual value there would be um, like Homer. And here we have the name, which could be you know, Maggie. I'll put and then that would be next, and that's how it would fall in memory. And then here we can have a name and that's actually Bart, and that could be next. And so this is how it falls in memory. So if you have like your head points to Homer, well, if we set um, next to point to, let's let's make this a little more complicated. Let's point next to 
the start of bar in memory. And we can point the next for for bar to point to Maggie because we let's say we sorted the list in order of oldest first. I can now traverse this linked list by going, okay, head, Homer, next, Bart, next, Maggie. And there's my linked list. Any questions on that, on linked list? No? Okay, let's take a look at what that actually looks like. Or actually, 